Okay, welcome to week three of HI-237 uh, Vikings. This is your next recorded lecture, the Scandinavian Mindset, Cosmology and Character. So just to review, uh, this is the next installment of our introductory lectures. Uh, like the last, it's meant to ground us in a specific aspect of the Scandinavian experience to make sure we're approaching the continental sources when we get there with a bit more awareness of everything they don't say. So today I want to explore some of the religious and ideological characteristics of the Scandinavians. It may seem like an odd combination, but I think it works rather well and contrasts nicely to the daily life aspect uh, aspects that we looked at uh, the last time. So I'm going to begin with a examination of pre-Christian religious belief, which is of course going to require getting just a little bit more specific about how we know any of it first. So dealing with myth is always tricky. We always have to ask ourselves how it gets to us. You know, how it having been written down, usually by much, much later writers, can skew or alter the original stories. So regarding Scandinavian cosmology, uh, plenty of scholars have hypothesized that it has something to do with the collision of Indo-European pastoralists with native agriculturalists. But it's hard to say anything concretely because, of course, what do we base it on? Adaptations from after Scandinavia's conversion to Christianity, uh, written by authors like Snorri Sturluson and Saxo Grammaticus. I'll tell you more about them both shortly. Now, are there any pre-Christian sources? Yes, but they're unsurprisingly rather difficult to use. So there are artifacts known as picture stones uh, in Gotland. Some of them can be related to the later mythology, but others can't. Uh, there is some skaldic verse of the pre-Christian period, which is preserved in later sagas and gives us glimpses of the gods. Uh, of course, you always have to question, are they preserved exactly as they were originally written or rather composed? You also, of course, have the Poetic Edda. Now, these are poems that deal with mythological subjects, and certainly we're positive that at least some of them would have dated originally from the pre-Christian period, but they are coming from the oral tradition into the written Christian tradition, and as always, they are going to be changed, at least to a degree, by that worldview. Uh, making that transition always changes an oral work into something different, even without the, the shift in religious belief, quite frankly. Um, the original oral work is not fixed. It is something, uh, a conglomeration, an assemblage of different pieces that is often assembled in subtly different ways, depending on who's performing it. Once you actually write that down into a fixed written text, it does become something different uh, than where it started. Now, Saxo, as a university-trained writer, would have altered what he wrote about deliberately. Snorri, in contrast, did want to pass on the tales authentically, but that doesn't mean he's passing them on in precisely the same way he received them. Now, even some of the poems that seem older may have been composed after the conversion by antiquarians, or they could have been changed in the tr transmission process and only look like they were produced by Christians. It's impossible to tell. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that the Poetic Edda is only preserved uh, in the Codex Regius, which is a manuscript from 1280. It is a copy, we believe, of an earlier manuscript that has since been lost. The uh, poems within the Codex are arranged in order from mythological to heroic. Uh, they begin with the Voluspa, the prophecy of the Cirrus, and this summarizes the mythology from the origin of the cosmos to its destruction. And this is the first poem in the manuscript. And when you read uh, the mythological excerpts that you were assigned for this week, that's where they come from. Now, other poems deal with Odin, Frey, Thor. The gods show up in the heroic poems as well. There is a second manuscript that contains some of these Eddic poems as well, and it dates from later uh, than the Codex Regius, and includes, uh, interestingly, a unique poem about Balder. Now, see how quickly I just summarized how we receive these poems? It constantly amazes me how much medieval culture we have only by chance. Think about, for instance, the single manuscript of Beowulf, which was nearly lost in a fire. What else have we lost over time? 
Skaldic poetry is another source for the mythology, as I mentioned. Um, again, as I've talked about a couple of times at this point, it's very difficult to translate. It's very formal, very ornate court poetry. Um, one of the forms that it takes is the shield poem. It's a poem that would describe shields given as gifts. Oftentimes these shields were decorated with scenes from narrative. And this is a particularly good source for mythic or heroic legend. Uh, Thor is the most frequent mythological subject in skaldic poetry. Now, we have so many pieces of these poems preserved because early Christian writers put a high value on poems about kings and rulers and continued to transmit them. Uh, these Christian Scandinavians saw them as stories that their people needed to know about the history of their own culture. All right, now I mentioned uh, I would tell you a bit about Snorri Sturluson. So he was born somewhere around 1178 or 1179, uh, connected to powerful people within Iceland. Uh, he was a godi, so he was a politician, basically. He was a law speaker twice. Uh, he was assassinated in 1241, possibly on the orders of the King of Norway. Now, Snorri is our best-known uh, Icelandic writer. He's a poet who used narrative framing to retell myths, legends, and uh, to guide younger would-be poets. Uh, while emphasizing to them that they were not to believe in the literal truth of any of what he wrote. So he worked on writing up the myths and exploring the tradition. Uh, he included uh, pokes, poke quotes from Eddic poetry. He clearly had a very broad base of knowledge of them. And uh, he paraphrased myths that he probably picked up from skaldic poetry, but doesn't quote it. Now, speculating on the nature of these beliefs, he tied he tied them back to a legendary genealogy uh, dating back to Troy. Uh, the grandson of Priam, uh, the king of Troy, was Tror, or Thor, who traveled the world, um, settled down with Sibyl, or Sif, and 18 generations later, we have Vodin, or Odin. Now, it's fair to say that by the uh, 12th century, most Icelanders would know of Agamemnon and Priam, and Snorri claims that the myths that they believe in come from this historical Thor. Now, this is what we call Euhemerism, and this is a, a name that, a term that comes from Euhemeros, a Greek philosopher who claimed that Zeus was, in fact, a mortal king, elevated in legend uh, to a deity. Now, Odin, meanwhile, uh, according to Snorri, was a prophet who moved to the north and set his sons up as kings there, uh, a way of making Scandinavia less peripheral to the civilized world, I would argue. Now, with his work, the Heimskringla, he starts with prehistory and places Asgard to the east, uh, says that it's ruled by the chieftain Odin, uh, who was so victorious in battle that his men used to call on his name, when they themselves were fighting. And he depicts the war between the Aesir and the Vanir as a sort of mythologized version of a historical conflict. So I think you can see just from that quick description how challenging he is as a source for pre-Christian mythology. And yet, we, we don't have a lot of other options, to be quite blunt. So it's safest, I think, to stick to just piecing together some of the basics. It's fair to say that Scandinavian mythology is a narrative with a strong cosmological orientation. It is concerned with how the world was made and how it is going to be destroyed and then reborn. Uh, the two groups of uh, beings fighting over this world uh, are what drives this cycle. So you have the gods, who are the Aesir and the Vanir, and the giants, the Jotnar. Both groups are described more or less as tribal or kin groups. The world that they operate in is recognizable as Scandinavia, although it has its own place names. It's, the climate and geography are still very similar. Now, there are basically three time periods at work in Scandinavian mythology. Uh, the first is the mythic past, which discusses the creation of the world by the Aesir and the Vanir. Uh, the Vanir, by the way, are a second group of gods that are a bit... Uh, nebulous. They seem to be associated with fertility, wisdom, and nature, and they are absorbed by the Aesir. You have the mythic present, where the Aesir and the Jotnar fight, and humans, dwarves, and sometimes elves get pulled into it. 
and the mythic future where the gods and the giants destroy each other and cause the death and rebirth of the world. Now, the center of the world is the tree of the gods, Yggdrasil, it's called in the Edda, and it grew and was destroyed continually because there were various uh, mythological creatures who subsisted on it and gnawed at it. And it was the meeting place uh, for the gods in Asgard, it's, uh, Asgard itself. Now, we see multiple references to nine worlds or nine realms. Uh, they are not, however, clearly specified. We know some for sure. Uh, so Asgard and Vanaheim for the gods, Midgard for mankind, Jotunheim for the giants, Elfheim for the elves, uh, the world of the dwarfs is in the earth, hell is for the dead, possibly also Valhalla. Uh, the list is not fixed, and it could vary as new imagery was included. Now, whatever you saw in the first Thor movie, you cannot easily produce a diagram of the Nine Realms. Tradition on this subject is shifting, sometimes contradictory, and it's key to remember that. All we ever get are snapshots. Uh, our source issues prevent us from having the full picture. And really, knowing what we do about mythology, it's likely that there were many overlapping traditions in any case. Okay, so let's talk about some of the gods. Uh, Odin, in myth, is ruler of the land of the dead, the god of battle, the god of inspiration, magic, and wisdom, and is known as the Allfather. Uh, some of the gods are called his sons. He is the one who sends the Valkyries to claim great champions when they die. Now, Odin rides the battlefield and gives victory to whichever side he chooses. Sigmund, for instance, the hero Sigmund, is giving a sword, given a sword by Odin and is his favored warrior until he's not. And Odin, on that day, meets him on the battlefield and shatters his sword with his spear. Now, according to uh, Saxo Grammaticus, Harald Wartooth of Denmark was taught battle strategy by Odin and granted victory by him until at one last battle, uh, Odin took the place of his charioteer and killed him with his own sword. Uh, Odin is often accused of faithlessness and of treachery. In the poem Hakor Normal, Hakanarmal, rather, uh, Odin is asked why he allows kings to die in battle, and his answer is the grey wolf watches the abodes of the gods. So in other words, he has to bring together champions to defend Asgard during Ragnarok. He moves from one world to the other on Sleipnir, which is his eight-legged horse. Uh, when he's on Earth, he usually shows up as an old man with one eye, wearing a hood or broad-brimmed hat. Now, when you look at Odin, he has definite uh, shamanic qualities. You know, he passes between worlds, he travels in animal or bird form, he is hung on a tree to gain wisdom, has mastery of the runes. These are all consistent with shamanic practices. Now, as the god of inspiration, he could inspire warriors to a berserk rage in battle. Uh, he is the source of the meat of inspiration, which he took from the giants. But in general, he's a god for aristocratic warriors. It's, he's not friendly towards women. Now, Thor is quite different. Uh, Thor's story is, uh, in myth emphasize his power over the natural world, and he contests with supernatural adversaries to protect the gods and mankind. Essentially, he is a protector god. Uh, he's more broadly based, and I would say probably less complex than Odin. Uh, his cult may actually have been more prominent than Odin's in various parts of Scandinavia. He's a more straightforwardly masculine god, I would argue. Now, his axe or his hammer represents the power of lightning to fell trees and shatter rocks. He's frequently absent from Asgard. He's usually off killing giants or the like. And finally, Loki. So, just get Tom Hiddleston out of your head, please. <laughs> Loki is a pretty unusual figure, as gods go. Was he actually a god, first of all? It's not 100% sure. Uh, he is a trickster. He's a friend in one of the origin stories. He's depicted as a friend of Odin, um, but also someone who fooled around with goddesses, uh, was responsible for the giant stealing treasure, but often helped get it back, and was fond of often creating a dangerous situation and then reaching out to res resolve it, or help resolve it. He's a craftsman, he's a gambler, he's a shape changer. 
But he's also involved in the murder of Balder, which is a great crime among the gods. Uh, he and his children play a role in Ragnarok as enemies of the gods. He seems to become more evil as the world deteriorates towards its death. Uh, some scholars have argued he's actually an archdemon. Others that he's just Odin's uh, evil aspect. Now, on numerous, there are numerous other gods in the Norse pantheon, obviously. But these three give you a sense of what kind of deities there are, and uh, are not, and what we're dealing with in this particular context. Now, I debated including this next bit, uh, but I decided to do so based on the fact that I could remind you we have to take any of these sources' descriptions of actual religious practices with a big grain of salt. Yet, there is almost certainly some degree of truth to these descriptions. So Snorri, for instance, tells us about three sacrificial feasts, one at the beginning of winter for plenty, one at midwinter for the growth of crops, one at summer for victory. It's essential to have a feast. It's a communal meal that you share with the gods. So the brewing of ale or mead was important. Uh, within the feast uh, site, it was hallowed to the gods. Uh, drinking horns have pa been passed around the hall. Uh, some of them have survived as grave goods. Uh, in Iceland, the Godi would have presided over the feast as long as there was no king. Now, some of the animals mentioned in such sacrifices include uh, the bear, the bull, the stallion, all fighting animals. Uh, sacrificial meals are also important. And they would seek uh, omens for the prosperity of the kingdom. Sacrifices were conducted at times of crisis, uh, for instance, between the death of a king and the installation of his successor, oftentimes in the face of enemy attack as well. Uh, also at the opening of the feng, or the assembly, in order to hallow the decisions made inside. Now, I debated whether or not, again, to talk about some of these details, because we're, we're not sure how believable Adam of, Adam of Bremen actually was. But he does describe uh, a temple at Uppsala in the 11th century. And he claims to have interviewed witnesses to the rites there. And they told him that the temple was decorated with gold, that it contained idols, that sacrificed animals were cooked and eaten in the Great Hall as part of the rituals. Apparently nine of every living male creature was sacrificed and hung in the grove there, and this included human beings. Now, likely there was some artistic license, but ritual bloodletting would have been part of the rituals there, blood being a part of magic. Uh, spilling blood would ensure fertility. Now, this temple may simply have been a feasting hall, in which festivals took part, uh, took place at certain times, rather than a dedicated religious building. Uh, Adam's judgment is a little bit questionable. Uh, now, we do have some archaeological evidence that suggests there were local religious sites in that immediate vicinity. Uh, excavations under a medieval church in Sweden found what looks like it would have been a sacred grove. Uh, there were uh, birch trees uh, with a large animal bone assemblage. Uh, bears, elk, stag, sheep, pigs, cows, uh, from the 10th and 11th century. Uh, certainly they may have been uh, skins or bodies hung from the tree. But uh, we should keep in mind that in the end we might just have to acknowledge we don't have access to a picture of their religious practices. If you do strip away some of the embellishment, however, they don't seem to have been all that different than other northern peoples from how they went about doing things. All right, um, when you read, uh, before we move on with this, when you read uh, Creation and Ragnarok, uh, ask yourself what about the Scandinavian mindset uh, you can gather from the story of the creation and the destruction of the world and what it tells us about their attitudes towards nature and the natural world. Uh, we're going to uh, make sure we talk about this in some detail uh, at our Zoom session. All right, now, the Scandinavian character. <laughs> it may be a, a little odd <laughs> to, to talk about a, a distinctive Scandinavian character. I mean, individuals are individuals. But I think it is worth pondering, at least for a few minutes, about a sort of uh, shared mindset on the non-religious level. 
looking at religious belief can tell us a lot about how they approach the world, but it doesn't tell us how they approached everyday life, you know, how they related to each other. Now, in any um, examination of the Vikings, we are fighting against significant stereotypes about what kind of people they were and how they believed. Uh, but it's, it's worth maybe looking at what they thought was good conduct, you know, what sort of outlook on the world they thought would lead to success and a reasonable level of happiness. You know, what makes you uh, a good member of the community? And one of the few sources that can actually allow us to reflect on this is the Havamal, uh, that translates as the sayings of the High One, uh, refers specifically to Odin. Uh, this is gnomic or wisdom poetry. Uh, it comes from the Poetic Edda. It is 164 stanzas long. It is not a single poem, but many different verses sort of slapped together. It's entirely likely that at least some of it dates back to the pre-Christian period. Almost certainly, again, it's been oral for a long time before it was written. Probably added to over time, altered, such as the nature of orality. What it doesn't show us is the stereotypical Viking. It is a guide to conduct, not to morality. And probably the most important thing it advocates is what you might call enlightened self, self-interest. Uh, suggests, suggesting that you should basically cultivate the good life. You should be temperate, you should be responsible. A good life is its own reward. Uh, it is weirdly cautious about women and a bit misogynistic in places. Uh, oddly, it also advocates not going crazy about your religious faith. It even says in places that better that you not pray than you make excessive offerings. There is little discussion of law and tradition. It is pragmatic and realistic. Uh, it is not the heroic ideal. So one of the themes that I would argue we see is uh, the uh, unheroic life. So ordinary life, uh, the ins and outs of everyday interaction with people. We're going to look at some examples as well. It also talks about friendship. Now, the editor of the original version of the Havamal that I used uh, talks about its depiction of friendship as contractual and even a little bit cynical. I'm not sure I believe that. I want you to think about when you see these bits and pieces, how much you yourself depend on your friends and how much somebody who lived in medieval Scandinavia would have depended on their friends. You are not, in most cases, going to die if your friends are not there for you in times of crisis. How does that compare to the Scandinavian experience? I would argue their crises tend to be more often life and death ones than ours do. Uh, and in that case, the support of a loyal friend could make all the difference. All right, so let's, let's just take a look at these. Uh, I have a few, first of all, about hospitality. So what you do with a guest, somebody who's uh, a visitor to your home. Uh, the watchful guest, when he arrives for a meal, should keep his mouth shut, listening with his ears and watching with his eyes. This is how the wise man finds his way. You know, this is from the guest's perspective, of course. Um, there is a fair bit about what you should do, uh, what you should give to a guest. But <coughs> clearly they are concerned about, you know, how, how you behave when you're essentially in someone's debt, when you're receiving their hospitality. Um, I'll skip ahead a bit. You should eat your meals early unless you're visiting a friend. A hungry man sits and gets sluggish and his wits are impaired. So, yeah, don't go and visit somebody that uh, you're maybe not on good terms with and then drink a lot. That's a very practical bit of advice, isn't it? Uh, you should keep moving. You should never be a guest forever in any one place. Your welcome wear will wear out if you stay too long beneath another's roof. Now, is that not almost a, a universal thing, right? Don't overstay your welcome. I would say even today there are people who could learn to uh, do to know that. Now, there's a little bit about uh, life and death. I found uh, uh, a couple of uh, really interesting verses on that. So shifting to the second column, the first two. Uh, better to be alive no matter what than dead. Only the living enjoy anything. I saw a fire burning for a rich man, and le he lay dead outside the door. A limping man can ride a horse, a handless man can herd, a deaf man can fight and win. It's far better to be blind. Uh, 
than fuel for the f fuel for the funeral pyre. It should be. It's even better to be blind than fuel for the funeral pyre. What can a dead man do? Now, compare that to our stereotypes about uh, Vikings wanting to go to Valhalla. Uh, there's a recognition here and in other stanzas where the Havamal talks about death that really death, death is the end. You know, death is no more of the pleasures of life after that point. And that urges uh, the listener to pay attention to those pleasures, to enjoy them while you have. It's also cautious about wealth. So I'll read you these next two. I saw big herds of cattle owned by a rich man's sons. Now they carry a beggar's staff. Wealth is like the twinkling of an eye. No friend could be more faithless. You might be wealthy, but it may uh, turn out and you may lose it at a moment's notice. If an unwise man chances upon money or a woman's love, he will grow more arrogant, but not more intelligent. He will be deceived about his own worth. Now, here is a really good lesson, something I believe that we as a society could learn from the Scandinavians, too. Just because you have money doesn't make you a good person, doesn't make you a smart person. You know, money is not, having money, being wealthy, is not a reflection of your virtue. And, you know, we, are, we live in a society that, unfortunately, is very heavily influenced by uh, certain aspects of Christian belief. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the prosperity gospel. You know, the concept that, you know, you become wealthy when God loves you. There is, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but there are some nasty associations between wealth and morality in Christian thinking. Now, um, one of the other major themes of the Havamal is moderation. Again, you know, have a, a tempered life, a uh, responsible life. Uh, enjoying the pleasures of life is important, but don't overindulge. So here's, here's a couple of things on that, uh, uh, that front. There is not so much good, as men claim there is, in alcohol for one's well-being. A man knows less as he drinks more and loses more and more of his wisdom. Again, very practical. I was drunk. I was too drunk at Wise Fialar's house. The best kind of feast is the one you go home from with all your wits about you. You know, how are you really going to enjoy the feast if you are so drunk that you're snoring under the table or making an idiot of yourself? A gluttonous man, unless he watches himself, will eat to his own detriment. Wise men will often ridicule a fool on account of his belly. So, you know, there are many ways to overindulge. And this one actually suggests that, uh, really, you can have too much wisdom as well. You should be only a little wise, never too wise. It's best not to know your fate beforehand. You'll live happier if you don't. It's a, little, it's a little poignant, you know, if you think too hard about deep and complex things of the world, you, you're going to know how small you are, uh, you're going to know, you know, how easily um, you could fall victim to all the dangers out there. And is that the way you want to live? Or do you, in a way, want to, you know, just focus on your own life? Uh, there are a few other stanzas that talk about the danger of having too much wisdom, which to me is just fascinating. Okay, so the last uh, column here are the ones I picked out about friendship. It's a long and crooked walk to a bad friend, even if he lives nearby. But it's an easy road to a good friend, no matter how long the journey. That's kind of sweet. Be a friend to your friend, and repay each gift with a gift. Repay laughter with laughter. <laughs> repay treachery with treachery. So, yeah, um, be good to your friends until they're not good to you, and then give it right back to them. If you have a good friend and really trust him and want good to come of your friendship, you should speak your mind with him, exchange gifts, visit him often. Now, there is such pragmatism here, right? If you want to keep your good friend your good friend, be honest with him. Recognize the importance of the friendship. Make gestures towards that, whether they're gifts, whether they're visits. But if you have another friend and you mistrust him but want to benefit him, from him. Nonetheless, 
you should speak to him kindly, flatter him, and repay his treachery with your own. It's not quite what we think about when we think about uh, the Vikings, right? Not the idea of them being sneaky. But there's a lot of advocating for being sneaky in situations like that in the Havamal. And you got to think back to Odin's character as a whole. You know, he's, he's not a nice man. He's not a nice god, rather. You know, he does a number of underhanded things. So the, the concept of deception is important in Scandinavian culture. It's a social tool, uh, I would argue. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, you also had an excerpt um, from the Havamal called Advice from Odin to Read. We'll talk about that at the Zoom session. It has some of the best poetry of the entire poem uh, in that section. So some takeaways. Uh, we have to concede there was a significant gulf between how the Scandinavians saw themselves, uh, their society, and their place in the world, and how outsiders saw those things. And sources like the Edda and the Havamal are idealized, but they're still revealing in a lot of ways. So that will do us for this one. Uh, next one up, basically the warrior ethos and Viking ships. Uh, so we will be back with that shortly.